This session is a springboard for innovation, smart protein for every plate, right? And I think in the previous couple of sessions we saw investors, our mature startups, even during the Innovator Showcase, we heard a lot of comments from our uh, investor judges about making protein accessible. 80% of India is protein deficient, right? Um, we heard about malnutrition, we heard about bottom of pyramid, we heard about making these offerings affordable. Um, all of that will obviously happen with scale and innovation. Um, so how do we basically bring smart protein, which is currently only probably accessible to the early adopter cohort in metro cities, right? People who are college educated, uh, people uh, who are essentially consuming uh, meat, eggs or dairy, but they want to replace with something healthier. They care about environment. How do we bring it to people who only care about taste, price and convenience, which is the true theory of change that um, GFI also focuses on. So uh, in our country, every plate is a complex premise, right? Um, we have multiple Indias within India. Uh, we know that every few kilometers, the diet and diversity of diet changes. Um, there are many demographics and there are also many misconceptions about those demographics, right? Like a long time we've spent educating people that India is not a vegetarian country primarily. Though the per capita consumption is less, but it's rapidly increasing, which is the challenge we are trying to solve for what happened with other developing countries taking a cue from that. Having said that, any sector that is trying to innovate and transform the status quo uh, to a better one undoubtedly first sees um, and markets to an early adopter cohort, which is what this sector started out as, right? And these people, like I said, are upwardly mobile, college educated, living in metro cities, who understand the impact of smart protein, um, the positive impact of smart protein on the world, and they might care about environment, health, animals, etc. But this sector will truly accelerate only when the masses adopt it. That is the real Bharat adopts it, right? So which is why we have to focus on day-to-day -day meals, center of plate uh, dishes, understand that mix, and really create innovative products to cater for the same based on taste, price, convenience, and accessibility. So how do we get from the hands of a select few to the plates of everyone? That's this session is going to focus on. So let me quickly introduce our panel for the day and our moderator. Uh, first, uh, I'll actually invite uh, Raji, uh, Raji Lakshmi, who's a market and insights advisor at GFI India to join, join the panel first. She'll be moderating the session. Next up uh, on this panel, we have Mr. Prakash MG from IFF. Mr. Prakash MG is the managing director, India subcontinent and commercial director Flavors Business Unit, IFF. Prakash brings over 30 years of work experience in CPG organizations like Unilever, Hershey's, Meet Johnson, and IFF. He has held various roles in sales and customer marketing across food and personal care categories. His experience includes leading diverse teams in large multinational organizations with a strong domain expertise in finance, marketing, HR, and manufacturing functions, and a holistic understanding of the African, Middle Eastern, and the Asian markets. Welcome, Mr. Prakash. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Prakash MG. Next up, we have Mr. Nirav Hariya, who's the head and biz of business development for South Asia for Jordan. Nirav Hariya is the head of business development and integrated solutions, uh, taste and well-being for Jordan. Mr. Nirav Hariya is the, uh, uh, he has the business development team with over 21 years of experience at Jordan and focuses on the upcoming categories in the taste and well-being space for South Asia. Plant-based protein products is one of the categories where Jivadan India is committed to support the growth and development of the entire plant-based ecosystem by offering and co-working with uh, their offerings with other for-profit and other startups in the ecosystem. We also have um, Mr. Siraj Chaudhary from NCML. Uh, please, Mr. Siraj, join us. You already heard from him earlier in the opening session. And I won't spend a lot of time um, again introducing him, but obviously Mr. Siraj comes with more than 35 years of business experience and leadership roles, building, turning around, acquiring, diversifying businesses in agriculture and food space. And Siraj is presently non-executive director and chairman of NCML and was previously the chairman of Cargill India, the Indian arm of Cargill Incorporated. Please, um, a very warm welcome, Mr. Siraj. We also have Mr. P.B. Chinappa, who is the managing director at Griffith Foods. I'd request Mr. P.B. Chinappa to join our panel as well. Um, Mr. P.B. Chinappa has been associated with the food and beverage industry for the past 30 years. He started his career with the erstwhile Tata Tea and then worked with Cadbury India Limited. Chinappa has been with Griffith Foods since 2007. At Griffith, he has managed various functions including sales, supply chain, and procurement before taking over as a managing director. 
And uh, unfortunately, we could not have Mr. Dheerash Talreja from AAK to join us because of some health reasons. But you can visit their booth in the sponsor and expo booth uh, right next to the um, main hall. With that, I'll pass on uh, the session to Raja Lakshmi for taking on the session further. Thank you, Shadrul. So I think as people still are coming, so we'll start our session. So contrary to the popular myth that India is a vegetarian country, so 77% of the 1.4 billion population in India identify themselves as non-vegetarians. And this is a number that has seen increase in the last decade, along with the increase in meat numbers. Still, uh, there is only 6 to 8% of Indians who consume Indian meat on a daily basis. So therefore, even though we have like 77% of people who has non veg but the per capita meat consumption is still one of the lowest for India. And also almost four out of the five Indians are protein deficient. So therefore there is a huge opportunity for the smart protein sector to come in as an additional source of protein to the mass India, which has limited access to the protein and also has leave limited impact on the planet too. So therefore, in today's exciting panel, we have the industry stalwarts, so who are going to offer their insights in terms of the journey towards acceleration of this sector, in terms of the key dimensions of taste, price, and convenience, and how are we going to take this market to the, the category to the true mass market. So this session is called a springboard for innovation, smart protein on every plate. So first, we'll start with a round of questions on the category, and then some of the work that's being done in this sector. So we'll start with you, Siraj. So in your tenure at Cargill, so you were credited with uh, fortifying, fortifying the edible oils with the essential vitamins, which was addressing malnutrition in India. So keeping that category in mind, so smart protein is also something which could follow a similar path going forward. So what do you think is, uh, how exciting do you find this category? Are there any learnings that you would like to pass on from your previous work where you've done in the edible oils in terms of like addressing the malnutrition? As I sort of said in the morning, uh, as I said in the morning uh, session that I, I personally believe that if we get the right model, uh, I mean, I said it in the morning and for the benefit of my co-panelists uh, who are probably not there in the morning, I said that I am a cynic as well as an, an optimist for this sector. I'm a cynic when I see ourselves trying to build this sector uh, by aping the West, uh, but I am an optimist when I see this, the potential of this sector for what it can do to Indian agriculture and Indian food plate. Uh, this has happened in the past. Uh, there are at least two commodities that I can talk about uh, that have witnessed this uh, change or this uh, momentum which has brought them much far forward. Uh, soybeans, uh, I happened to start my career with soybean crushing uh, 35 years ago and that was more to do with, it was really a taste, uh, awfully tasting edible oil with no one knowing what to do with it and you know the fishy smell and the beany taste and the meal was all exported for animals to be consuming outside India. Today, uh, soybean oil is the largest selling consumer oil in the country and uh, our meal exports have gone down because now we are finding ways to consume. Our animals are, and birds are consuming it, but uh, I guess whatever you see outside uh, at the moment, we humans will also be consuming it in a different form and shape. So that is an example of how a particular commodity uh, came in, settled in. It wasn't an Indian produce. It came from different parts of the world. It was being used in the US and parts of Latin America and Europe, and it found a home in India. Served a very specific need for a cooking medium, which was till then about vanaspati and desi ghee and um, maybe rapeseed oil. If it hadn't been for soybean and then palm later, India would have been a problem case for uh, oil supplies or cooking medium. The next category, which is actually more recent than soybean, is corn. 
uh, historically corn for India was really about what we, you know, people grow for, uh, the farmers grow for uh, feeding the animals or we identified with it as uh, cornflakes or uh, popcorn or, uh, you know, the corn uh, selling on the roadside, uh, uh, the butta. But uh, the moment industry got engaged with it, which is in terms of processing corn for uh, starch, for glucose, for maltodextrin, for the various uh, modified starches, the cultivation of corn took off. So I think this one is for really the pulses and the, the peas and everything. Uh, this is a great opportunity for India and the industry in India to come together for this space. And uh, if that is done, it will help bring, because today the challenge we face is we are importing most of the protein. And once we can produce it locally, it will be cheaper. It will affect the Indian ag economy. It will get the government to rally behind you. And it will, as I said again in the morning, that this is a protein which this country is waiting to consume because unlike anywhere else in the world, we really have only chicken and fish to count as protein apart from a little bit of mutton, while the rest of the world, I mean China, if we take as a comparative, switched on to pork and beef, which we do not have as much of an option. So I think if we go in that direction, we have a great future ahead. Thank you, Siraj. That really reinforces our belief in the category. So those examples were great. So moving on to Prakash. So IFF has recently announced the opening of its new culinary design center in Denmark. And we also know that IFF has been betting big on plant-based uh, food and then beverages in India. So can you please tell us some of the work that's happening at IFF in this space? Yeah, sure. Uh, see, fundamentally, if you look at across the food sector, there is one category that is working very closely with the customer in terms of collaboration. At this point of time, it's the protein space. That's because really there is not enough uh, proven evidence or example saying that somebody can go and do it and this will be right. So there is a need for a lot of collaboration. And keeping that in mind, uh, we opened a, a protein, reimagined protein innovation center uh, in one of our facilities in Europe. What essentially we are trying to do there is how we can collaborate with the end manufacturer to bring the concept to a reality. Because uh, there is, if, especially if you look at the plant-based meat, and as rightly said by Siraj, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a category that is fighting with very different cuisine models. You're, in India, you're fighting with a, you know, butter chicken, you're in, in, or a, a, a biryani that's cooked for eight hours. You're going to compete with that category. How do you really get the texture, the taste element, and uh, the bounds that you that, an, uh, that, uh, that comes out of meat or uh, any other uh, non-vegetarian product, how do you really get that technically correct? And that requires collaboration. And that is where I think IFF, uh, we believe that this category will be definitely a, a, a promising category for future. Maybe in some markets it will hit faster, some markets it will take a little bit of a time. But I think there is enough consumer uh, interest in this category now lot of money being chased uh, behind this category and that's what we are trying to see how we can really collaborate and support and work as one team with the customers and with the IFF technologies to really offer a solution that is working with the consumer. That's really the, the bigger ticket that we are doing. Second, from a reimagined protein point of view, that's what you alluded to, it's just not only in the plant-based uh, meat alternate. It can cut across various models. It can be in beverage, it can be in dairy, it can take various end uses. So I think uh, today, you know, at least in the corporate world, whenever you sit in a, uh, you know, a group of meeting uh, like this, people think that, you know, alternate protein is just a milk alternate. I think uh, the canvas is much, much broader. In fact, uh, you know, many of us know that SoFit was launched many, many years ago by Godrej, which is the first, probably the first uh, you know, protein drink that came into India. So I think there is enough opportunity. We are also trying to see through our research, through our consumer insights in terms of how we can broad base this narrative and how we can support uh, our customers in meeting the consumer demand. Thank you, Prakash. So moving on to you, Mr. Chinnapa. So Griffith has set up a task force for smart proteins and it's also launched a smart protein focused business unit called Nourish Ventures, 
which is partnering with innovators and then developing new products and like developing new processes. So can you throw some light on this excellent work that's happening at Griffith? Sure. Uh, first of all, good evening, everybody. Uh, Griffith Foods is a privately held 103-year-old company. We call ourselves as product development partners specializing in uh, food ingredients. Having said this, we like uh, our friends here from Rudon and IFF, we have a global presence. So what we do is we work with local and regional food companies across, uh, across the world. Being family owned, Griffith has always put people and the planet and sustainability, sustainability at its uh, uh, forefront. So over the years, we've evolved as a company and we believe in existing for purpose which is blending care and creativity to nourish the world. So here I'd just like to stress on the word nourish. So we are making investments in innovations and technologies that go on to nourish the largest number of populations. So may not be directly, but we would partner with, with uh, our customers to create products which play in the field of nourishing the greatest number, at the same time, products that are friendly uh, in, from the sustainability standpoint. Uh, having said that, Nourish Ventures is a, an arm of ours which partners with entrepreneurs and, and technocrats, people who have innovative technologies and ideas, uh, who would help accelerate the future of sustainable agriculture, having the greatest impact on the largest populations. So we partner with entrepreneurs, uh, collaborate, guide, connect them to our resources, our global footprint, and communities which will help them scale impact. Having said that, we would continue to invest, but Nourish Ventures would be the vehicle that would you know, help us accelerate uh, the impact that we want to have. Sure. Thank you so much for that. So Neerav, a similar question to you. So Jivatan has been setting up smart protein hubs all over the world, and then it's also like uh, working on co-creating those plant-based food experiences for many of its clients. So can you please tell us some of the work that's happening at Jivatan? And also, what's the kind of vision for India? So, um, you know, I, I'll just relate this entire work that's happening uh, to India and uh, the plant attitude uh, initiative that Jivadan has taken uh, all about. It is based on uh, three pillars and those three pillars are called tastes good, feels good and does good. So we are in the taste good phase where the entire country is or the entire globe is into products which are just tasting good at the moment. Then is the next step where it has to feel good. When it feels good, obviously it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it becomes a mass product. And then is does good, which is what um, the people from uh, earlier panel, panels were saying, Sohail I think mentioned, you know, it should do something good. Now, based, based on all the all these pillars and the plant attitude uh, initiative, we have collaborations across the world where we have uh, collaboration. We are collaborating with processors. We are collaborating with uh, end end product manufacturers, and at the same time, we are looking at uh, a lot of uh, investments in uh, scientific developments, which will feed for the future. The technology is to be scaled up. And once it is scaled up, uh, it goes to the masses. The other thing that, which is very, very India relevant is we are bringing these technologies to India. And we are ensuring that uh, the Indian customer or the consumer is at par. Uh, and what, what I also see is India has a lot of opportunities for exports. We have been talking throughout the day that India can become the export hub. It could be the next IT moment for India. Uh, so 
while we talk about Indianizing and localizing products, we should also look, uh, look at globalizing the products. The moment we do that, it becomes cost effective for everyone. And which is where I think a lot of the startups and the big players will able to address a lot of questions. And Jividan has its expertise. We are bringing those expertise. We are working with the players. So we are, we want to have this one plus one is equal to 11 effect and ensure good products, good tasting products come to the market. Uh, to sum it up, I would say we want to be the lead guitarists in the music band that is going around. Thank you, Neeraf. So it's quite evident that there's a major momentum in the market with a lot of companies and SKUs that are getting launched, and also a momentum in the back end with all the plans that we've heard right now, with focused business units coming, which are focused on plant-based products. So but what we are still seeing in terms of products so most of the products that are in the market today are like maybe we could compare them to the first generation of smartphones, like in terms of how much they can get improved over the next coming years. So in this next section, so let's deep dive into look into what are some of those opportunities in which the product can improve. So again, going to you, Nirav. So since you've talked about the product, like which is local and also like making them global, so as we all understand, India has multiple markets within it. So once we start launching a product, so there is nothing that we can do at a national level. So the products need to be modified to different regions and the communication needs to be modified to different regions. So what are some of the learnings that you're taking from the global markets and how are you trying to localize them? Okay. I think it's a very uh, tricky question and always, uh, always a question in mind whether I should imitate what is there in the Western market or should I localize it. Uh, I would, I feel that India is in a stage where, uh, where people are just getting aware about this category, about the plant-based products and they are, they, they are just feeling it. Uh, you know, here say and you have some vegan restaurants coming up, some articles in the newspaper. The best way to introduce uh, the products into this market is the snacking format, which I think all, all the startups or all the companies in the space have done it right. They have entered the snacking market. Uh, wherein you're asking consumers, please taste it, indulge into it, and you're not asking them to replace any part of their meal. So there's no compromise involved. So there is a lot of openness in tasting them. Once you have the acceptance is when the movement will start. So you have, what are these snacking products? What do you see? Fried rum patties, kebabs, samosas, momos. These are the starting products. Now you have to move them to the phase two, which is again, as I link it, feels good. So you have to move them to a product, which is their conscious choice and not, uh, not a compromise. So if the person is choosing a product consciously, he has already bought into your idea. And once that happens is when uh, the mass products will come in. And for this, I feel this is one uh, request to the entire uh, industry right now, the plant protein industry is Make your consumer taste more products. Make them aware about it. We, we speak about Maggie, we speak about, you spoke about SoFit, but how did they become the brands they are? A lot of people for two years, three years, went about tasting it, got used to it, and after that it became a part of your palate. So please go ahead and make people taste the products as much as you can once they understand the product, once they are well aware about the product, it, that is when the entire industry will actually see a lot of traction. Sure. Thank you, Neera. So while there is opportunity, as you've mentioned, so right from snacking to the center of the plate, but we all know that taste is a primary driver when consumers have meat in India. 
So when we are recreating those products, we not only need to recreate the taste, but the entire sensorial journey that the consumer goes through when he's having anything which is related to meat. So maybe, uh, so where do you think we, are, we stand today as an industry in this sector? Uh, in terms of the sensorial journey or like the entire taste and all the related parameters? Yeah, <clears throat> probably that's the biggest challenge the category faces today, especially when it comes to meat alternate. As it said earlier and, and uh, other speakers spoke about, uh, you know, how important is, it, is the taste for these products. Just compare between a non-vegetarian food and a meat alternate. People are looking at uh, you know, juicy texture, great mouth feel, and then, uh, you know, when you have a, a, a genuine non-vegetarian item, you don't have any sort of a bitter note and lingering, which that, that hits your uh, sensory in a bad manner. I think that journey needs to be replicated in any of the, uh, you know, brands that we are today uh, providing to our consumers. So this is the biggest challenge both uh, uh, both uh, for the consumer to accept, you know, is that you can't get a, a butter chicken equivalent uh, that is cooked for four hours, five hours in a, in a processed food uh, packet. So there is some amount of transition that needs to happen. And that is the biggest challenge even uh, for, the, for the industry itself today. <clears throat> I think use of relevant technology is to some extent helping to mask and give a better, uh, you know, taste profile to these products. Uh, but this is something uh, I see as a big task ahead of us as an industry. I don't think really anyone has cracked it uh, to the extent that, yes, I can really match it uh, to the genuine dish that I would like to compare. If you take any other product, for example, a cream biscuit or a juice or something, you always look for either parity or you want a better tasting uh, product. But when it comes to this category still, uh, the sensorial journey for the consumer is a little uh, short. That is the reason you are seeing a lot of lapses in this category. People are trying it, but uh, they compare it with whatever they have it at their home and then they go back and they say that it's not really uh, meeting my expectation and then there is a dropout. So, uh, so sensorial journey needs to be addressed and I think the industry is working hard to see how we can bring in technology to address this. But uh, that's that's a challenge uh, for us to address as a category. Uh, sure, project. Prakash. So along with the taste, so the other key parameter is price. So while we know most of Indians love their meat, but they don't have it on a regular basis, purely for the affordability reasons. So today when we look at this sector, most of the products are coming at a price premium compared to the conventional meat items. So coming to you, Mr. Chinnapa, so how is Griffith thinking its journey towards achieving this price parity with the conventional proteins going forward? I wouldn't uh, talk of it as how just Griffith is looking at it, but uh, on a broader spectrum, I would typically break this market or what we're targeting with uh, plant-based into three fairly distinct markets. One is uh, the flexitarians, people who are consuming non-vegetarian, but want to consume plant-based uh, feels like, tastes like stuff uh, for various reasons. The second would be the typical vegetarian consumer who's looking for uh, options. But in my mind, I think the third part of it is, is, is more important. It is that consumer that cannot at today afford conventional protein, right? So how are we going to, uh, I'm looking at it more from the nutritional standpoint of how can we as industry deliver uh, protein, like you alluded to four, to four of out of five Indians being uh, protein deficient. So that would be the larger market that uh, thing. And to take on from what uh, Mr. Siraj mentioned, so in case you're looking at something of, of a market of that sort, what is it that we couldn't do in the back end? to scale up to that. Right now, most of the products that are available in the market is, is more, for, more for the evolved consumer uh, who, who's, who's got fairly deep pockets and can afford it. But for prices to come down, and obviously prices would come down if there is scale, you need to develop scale. 
The other part of it we spoke about is localization of protein sources. Currently, most of it, the, the main price driver for, for products that are available in the market is, is uh, protein. Having said that, I think India has got one of the best sources of protein in mung beans, right? We produce about 3.06 million metric tons of, of the crop every year. And it apparently has about 24 grams of protein. So why can't we look at it as, as a, a source of uh, protein and, and governments and industry uh, look at incentivizing both growing as well as extraction or, or isolating of, of protein concentrates from mung beans. I think overall that would give the, uh, the industry a little shift, a paradigm shift from targeting supermarket cold storage shelves to making protein available uh, to the large population that is protein deficient uh, today. Also a circular economy where planter, I mean uh, agriculturists benefit, uh, industry benefits, so you have a whole industry that we are building on the concept of, of plant-based proteins. Thank you. Sure. So taking a cue from there, Siraj, so in terms of localizing the supply chain, so India is one of the, India is the largest producer of pulses and also we are the leading producers of many crops like wheat, rice, etc. But we still hear from the industry that they are importing ingredients from other countries. So how do you think, like, it's, there are concerns about the quality of ingredients that are available in India, which is leading to people uh, going for imports. So how do you think we can use our agricultural diversity to localize the supply chains? And also in the morning's presentations, we have seen like a huge potential for exports, and which we are also seeing in many panels because globally the category is a little more mature. So how can we become the hub for many countries in terms of like sending at least the crops or the ingredients? So you're right. I mean, India has a very, you know, diverse uh, source of proteins available because we've historically been a plant uh, protein consuming country, unlike a lot of other countries. Uh, now, how do we take that uh, or convert that? I think somewhere uh, the stage at which this industry is, uh, the focus is more on product development. I think if I have one um, not, I wouldn't say a complaint, but concern is that, uh, you know, there are a number of players who are currently in this space. Uh, they've all come in in the last few years. I think there's a rush to get to the market, uh, which is needed, of course. But uh, if you do not have a properly developed product, uh, uh, you are actually, uh, you know, Prakash mentioned about SOFIT, right? I, I spoke about soya in the beginning. So soya was this great hope uh, for the future when it happened uh, many years ago. Uh, but the soya food per se did not get as much traction. The, the risk is that if you don't get your product right in terms of feel, taste uh, and everything, you can actually be putting yourself back by a few years because it, the consumer will need to be reconvinced that uh, this is good. But so while that is one side of it, the problem is that the industry hasn't looked at, uh, or it's too young, frankly, so I won't blame the industry. The way it is structured today is that it hasn't looked at linking back to the supply chain. It has been focused on creating products which will match the taste, texture, feel, of what it is trying to replace or complement, but uh, the linkage to agriculture or the back end hasn't yet come up on the agenda with as much uh, attention and focus. But for scale to be established, it is something that needs to be done, whether it is the same industry or partnership. I mean, again, I said this in the morning that just as it takes a village to rear a child, here we will need to be bringing in the ag scientists to, again, if we talk about moong or we talk about any other source of protein, are we agriculturally evolved to be making the best use of the resources that we have? Is there science that needs to be put in place to improve that? If that is a need, obviously science will not go in until there is an investment uh, following that uh, commodity or product development. Then of course the whole processing technology, which is where investment is coming in, but beyond that there will be a need for culinary uh, evolution because it's not just about creating more burgers and uh, patties. Uh, when I look at a protein supplement and protein consumption for masses, it is not just about meat supplements. We could be creating so much more. I mean, historically, you've had dal vadis and things like that. In every cuisine of India, you have protein-based uh, vegetarian food, which has been 
inherent to that diet and there would be more options that we could create from that. And then, of course, it needs the muscle and the legs of large uh, FMCG companies because taking it to the consumer on the mass scale will again require a lot of investment. Uh, so there will again be need for partnerships there where there could be partnership between science and producer and between producer and the marketer uh, for this whole ecosystem to evolve. It will take time. As I said, I am an, I'm optimistic that this will happen. Uh, but we need to do it the right way because uh, going wrong can be shooting ourselves in the foot too soon. Thank you, Siraj. So coming to our last section. So one of the major reasons why India gets looked at by most of the companies is the sheer size of the market. But that is only true when we are able to access the true mass market. So. The question or the main intention of this panel is to address how are we going to take this smart protein category to everybody's plate in the Indian mass market. So let's discuss some of those action steps here. So starting with you, Prakash. So achieving economies of scale is critical. So as we have seen in terms of driving the prices down. So what are the kinds of like, and also we've been talking about a lot of partnerships which will help us reach there. So what are the kinds of multi-stakeholder partnerships that you would like to see for this industry which can help us get there? Yeah, I think see, um, if you really fundamentally, if you look at it, Siraj uh, mentioned this uh, in, his, uh, in his remark that it has to link back to, to the actual manufacturing. Today, if you really look at uh, the products, products that are sold, most of it is imported. Why the end price is really much high? Before my session, everyone spoke about the end price. Uh, if you want to really go into the middle of the market in our country, if it has to be consumed in tier two, tier three cities, how do you make it affordable? If you want to make this affordable, you need to really develop soy crop. The quality of the crop should be better. There should be government intervention in that area. And there should be a lot of collaboration between, uh, between uh, the, the farmer community and the government and the private sector to help this happen. Uh, I can just refer to the mint industry long back. 20 years back, uh, you know, mint wasn't grown at this pace. But you know, today, because of uh, various uh, partnership today, we have good quality mint being produced in our country. So, uh, so we need to, there should be some amount of intervention at that space. That's when the farming community finds it lucrative and you see the entire ecosystem uh, getting into this and then you can sp speak about protein to the masses. Today, whatever we are speaking today is, is just addressing a very, very small set of for the population, which is, uh, it's not going to, we are not really impacting the larger, uh, uh, population which is really deficient on protein. So, so that is the critical element for me and uh, thankfully what I hear at least in my limited conversation with, uh, with the industry is that there is a lot of openness to really look at it and we need investments to build this infrastructure that would help uh, soy cost competitive compared to what we are today uh, priced and uh, uh, the dependence on imports has to really uh, dramatically reduce. And that's when you would really hit the masses. That, once you do this, then you need to find uh, the, the, the texture, taste, and so on and so forth. Because that's going to continue to be, that is going to be very critical. Uh, because the more you go down the market, the more, uh, you know, the cuisines change. You can't have the standard one product that is available in Delhi that can be sold in Merit. So the cuisine's change. So you need to do, there is a lot of innovation that is required and that innovation should not be coming at a huge cost. So that is, uh, combination of these two is what would really help the product to go into the masses as per me. Sure. Thank you, Prakash. A similar question to you, Mr. Chinnapa. So what are some of the initiatives that the industry and the government can do together so which can help this industry like get onto everybody's plate? Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the last statement that I made about uh, the various market segments. So if you look at it at the various market segments, the industry per se, the alternate protein industry and, and ingredient providers such as ours, 
we need to ask ourselves, what are we trying to establish, right? Are we trying to establish a change, change a eating habit? Or we, are we looking at animal welfare slash sustainability, etc., etc. So we need to see what are we trying to establish and what's the end result. And obviously, if you look at, you define your end result, then you need to understand what's the kind of impact and the scale that you want to do things at. So having said that, I think one of the important aspects that we need to address is uh, we, in this whole conversation with my fellow panelists, we, we, we also address protein deficiency. So if you're talking of plant-based and trying to replace a, a meat eater with a product that is plant-based, you're not really addressing protein deficiency. You're just changing some eating habit or for whatever reason. I would look at it from the lens of how could we use this platform to increase the nutritional status of our populations, right? 74, 75% of our population is nutrient I mean, protein deficient. We are apparently, we have some of the lowest protein consumption in the world at 47 grams. So how, how and, and to build scale, how can we take this and probably, uh, maybe a very futuristic thought, but how can we incorporate it into government noon meal feeding programs, wherein you're addressing protein deficiency at a very young age amongst the lower population groups. So that would be my take. First, we need to define what's the goal that we are looking at, what is the impact that we want to scale up to, and then, like my fellow panelists said, strengthen your supply chains behind it to support that thing. So you need intervention from government, you need intervention from industry, you need intervention from, from various stakeholders, nutritionists, et cetera, et cetera. So after defi defining what your end purpose is, and I think that would lead, uh, define the journey that we need to take. Thank you. Thank you, that's very well put. So as we've been discussing, so we are only like scratching the surface. So we are only like now targeting the early adopters who are like typically looking, living in the metros. So this question is for you, Siraj. So as we all know, the most of India doesn't live in metros. So we live in smaller cities and we live in rural areas. And we also know that the infrastructure in terms of cold storage or logistics, warehousing, is a major problem once we move beyond the metros. So, but for this category, with most of the products being in the frozen space, so for us to move beyond the early adopters and the metros, we need to go beyond these cities. So, what are some of the things that can be done? Because, like, you've done a lot of work in this space at NCML. So, what are some of the things that can help grow this category beyond these metros in terms of infrastructure? You know, I'm glad we're having this conversation now. Uh, this would have been a huge problem five years ago. But uh, with the spread of e-commerce, the whole logistics, distribution, warehousing, distribution, uh, reaching to the end consumer on a regular basis, now even at 10 minutes notice or whatever, uh, that, that space has evolved. So I think uh, the carrier is uh, ready sooner than the rider to come onto it. So, uh, so we are in a better space now. I think uh, uh, this is something uh, which is, I mean, the good news is that it is not a unique product which requires all this. There are many products which have ridden on this uh, or faced with this problem. I mean, we have had numerous stories. Uh, who's from Cadbury's here, uh, right? I mean, that whole shifting, uh, I mean, distributing chocolates used to be a big problem. And, uh, you know, those, uh, what was that? The uh, white layer on top. Right. And the, the coolers, the busy coolers or whatever you'll put into the retail space. So I think we have moved quite some distance. So this element is not going to be a limitation, at least in the foreseeable future, for this category to expand. And I think that's an advantage this category has relative to its, some of the predecessors, whether it was chocolates or ice creams or whatever else, uh, or even you know meat, which is now being sold differently than it was being uh, sold in the past. Uh, I think uh, we are, at least for the state of the industry today, uh, I think the infrastructure exists. OK, great. So the last question to you, Neera. So in many of the mature markets, so the distribution was pretty e into, I wouldn't say it very easy, but still they are very consolidated in terms of they have modern trade, they have like huge food service. So most of these big players like Beyond Meat, Impossible, they've entered through food service, they've created that buzz. 
and then they've entered the consumer households. So what do you think would be the distribution strategy for a market like India, so which can help the product reach the mass market? That's a difficult one, but a very interesting question. I think uh, the earlier panel discussed about, you know, the challenges of distribution. Uh, I was sitting there and thinking about it and I said, and, and one of the panel members also mentioned, why don't we all come together and consolidate one distribution channel and see if we can, uh, if we can uh, leverage it and ease out. Can we take a cue from how the quick service restaurants work? Can we take a cue from how the Horeca segment works? How they distribute uh, you know, their products? And can that be adapted to this segment as well? Uh, this will help in two ways. One is uh, introducing the category to these areas because food service, Horeca and you know, the allied industries uh, or the categories are very interesting for this space and it will solve your uh, distribution strategies as well. A lot of marketing push also needs to come. Can we have a plant-based uh, fridge only in the supermarkets? Can we have uh, free tastings? Uh, free tastings if you go to a Swiggy, Zomato or Alicious or any website and order your trial free order now, just try it out. Can we look at, uh, uh, like you have the million, you know, the one week sale or the million dollar sale, can we have a vegan sale? There are a lot of these uh, initiatives that a marketer can take the help of a supply chain and try and experiment with models. So you have this initiative and you're experimenting that with a bulk push. So you're trying to test a model. At the same time, you are not risking a lot. So when you do that hybrid or consolidate or have a push, you will find these new solutions. It's not an easy road, I know. It's not an easy answer at the moment, but uh, as uh, Shiraji mentioned, five years ago, our problem statements were different. Today, they are different especially with uh, distribution. So can we find those solutions? And I feel the solution lies somewhere there and it is about to be found out quicker or sooner than later. Thank you, Neera. So that brings us to the end of this session. I have one intervention. We're talking about masses and how to get to it. And this can be a collective uh, industry effort here which is that, uh, you know, there have been various uh, debates across the country in different states in terms of the midday meal, whether to have an egg in it or not in it. And, you know, uh, this is a very good product, which if they, obviously the industry will have to come together to have it introduced in certain regions where there's a progressive state government or willing to pay for it or whatever, to get this product introduced in the midday meal. Uh, because once you do that, and the, over a period of time, there is evidence of the impact it is having, the acceptance of the taste. Uh, your case becomes uh, better to push with the government as well as uh, you're somewhere seeding your customers and you can then expand. Uh, and as it expands, it gives an opportunity to create scale for the industry. Sure. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you, Siraj. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure, pleasure having you all here. So I found the session extremely insightful, and I hope our audience also find it insightful. Thank you so much.